So welcome back everyone. Um, it's good to see uh, so many of you in the room. Um, before I turn the floor over to our keynote speakers with some uh, fireworks, I wanted to take just a minute to step back and uh, reflect on what we've heard yesterday. Um, we started the day with uh, Susan Athey, the chief economist at the DOJ. Uh, she made the point that going to court with machine learning based evidence is a great litigation strategy, which came as a surprise to many of us. Uh, this was very refreshing. So Susan, once again, thank you so very much for, for that great uh, introduction to the third um, annual conference. Then we've heard from uh, Rebecca Williams and Bill Kovacic. They discussed the future of computational antitrust. Um, they talked about um, the need for antitrust agencies to systematically document their past activities in order to better shape future policy. They discussed how to educate lawyers about computer science, whether in the classroom, at the university, or within competition agencies. And they concluded with some remarks on automated antitrust litigation. Um, and then we've heard from four different competition agencies in the agency carousel. They presented their progress in computational antitrust, and they showed that the topic is not only academic, but also very practical. And we ended the day with a panel on AI with four scholars discussing the legal framework for antitrust agencies to rely more heavily on machine learning. Today, we have a great program with a keynote in just a minute, a panel discussing results achieved with computational tools, a computational carousel with two demos from companies, and a grande finale with one academic, one technical expert, and two globally recognized practitioners discussing computational antitrust. All right, on to our keynotes. So uh, Glenn and Zoe are co-authors um, and they have prepared a talk about what a whole new direction for antitrust uh, might look like. This new direction involves, involves computational power. That's all I know. And I'm um, uh, as equally excited as uh, you are uh, right now. Now, here is Glenn's official bio, and then I'll give a less official bio. The official one is that he is the co-founder, sorry, the founder and the research director of the Microsoft Research Special Project, the Plural Technology Collaboratory. He is also the founder of Radical Exchange, um, and he is the founder and chair of the Polarity Institute. He is the senior advisor to the Getting Polarity Research Network at Harvard University. Now, less officially, Glenn is one, if not my favorite thinkers, to get on the phone with, which I know is very specific, but let me tell you why that is. Whenever I get a chance to spend 30 minutes with Glenn on the phone, I leave the call with many great ideas for my papers, pointed comments, and not just food for thought, but a wall buffet of thoughts. So I'm very much looking forward to today's keynote for that uh, precise reason. On his side is uh, Zoe. Uh, she is a junior fellow at the uh, Harvard Society of Fellows. Her current research focuses on privacy and transparency in markets, contracts, and other forms of communication. She received her PhD in economics from Harvard University in 2023, so congratulations. Uh, and she holds a MPhil in history and philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. Now, maybe less officially, although this information in our, is on our website, Zoe is also a poet. And so, of course, I had to explore that a little bit this morning. Um, and I thought that everyone would enjoy just a second of our poetry before diving into more brutal topics. So here we go. I'll try my best. I used to envy the trees wearing mists as veils, modest trunks exploding into southerns of muscle bounds, legs soon as they reached the soil. Now even trees seems docile and susceptible which I thought was very beautiful. So on that note, to both of you, thank you so very much for being with us and the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, Thibaut. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. 
I'm going to give the presentation. Zoe will field the questions. Um, but this is joint work uh, in progress. I'm um, building on previous work that we did called uh, economic democracy and market power. Um, and it's going to be a little bit different than what Thibaut described. Uh, it's a little bit less methodologically focused in the sense of uh, you know evidence gathering and a little bit more methodologically focused in terms of how we can use computational tools to reimagine antitrust remedies and interventions. Um, and it's inspired, uh, despite the fact that it's, you know, we're going to try to give a bit of a new approach by something very old. So, um, you know, going back to John Sherman, antitrust was originally an anti-monarchical project. Uh, you know, Sherman uh, said that if we would not endure a king as a political power, um, we should not endure uh, a king over the production of the transport, production, or sale of any of the necessities of life. And, you know, there have been different approaches. There were, at the inception, different approaches to how to counter monarchy in this way. The one that's been most, you know, discussed and popular recently is kind of the populist approach associated with people like Williams Jennings, Jennings Bryant and uh, Louis Brandeis that really focused on this Jeffersonian tradition of avoiding and breaking up concentrations of power. Um, a second approach that's associated with kind of pr the progressives, people like uh, Teddy Roosevelt um, and uh, uh, the, you know, progressive intellectuals um, was one of <clears throat> using democratic political power to sort of co-opt and uh, control these concentrations of private power. Um, you know, sometimes they use breakups, but the real goal was to achieve regulation, maybe even nationalization to uh, subordinate that those concentrations of private power to democratic nation states. Um, Walter Lippmann is perhaps one of the people most associated with this, had a great influence on the New Deal. But there's a there's a third tradition that I think is often forgotten, but equally, if not uh, more important, uh, associated with people like Henry George and John Dewey. And the vision there was neither, um, you know, make the na democratic nation state supreme nor break up power. It was instead to constitute new constellations of democratic accountability associated with the new technological possibilities opened up. This is associated with the utilities and municipalization movements with the labor movement. Um, and uh, it was perhaps best expressed in this wonderful book by John Dewey called The Public and Its Problems, in which he argued that uh, new technologies create new forms of interdependence. And the principle underlying democracy is real is not nation states it's really the notion that interdependence should be self-governing that the people who are subject to the power created by new forms of interdependence should be the people who have the say on controlling the direction that that interdependence evolves and that in order therefore do we argued for uh interdependence and, and democracy to survive neither of the other two options are really viable because technology creates these new forms of interdependence only by creating new publics, new polities that could democratically govern these can we actually have democracy. Because these new forms of interdependence don't follow exactly nation state lines. So simply subjecting them to democratic oversight in the nation state sense does not actually achieve the substantive goals of democracy, which are that the actual interdependence is governed by the people who uh, are subject to that interdependence. And the economics of this um, are actually incredibly simple, much more simple even than the Chicago school tradition. They are almost uh, uh, mechanically obvious, and yet they're much more radical than that tradition. In particular, um, monopolies, the problem is they internalize their profits, they don't in internalize the surplus of their counterparties, of consumers, workers, or uh, people who are the subject of externalities. And if there is a way by changing the corporate governance, by changing who is in charge of the corporation and to what 
it is accountable, you can incorporate those unincorporated surpluses, then without having to uh, uh, give up the benefits of economies of scale, without having to have one nation state intervene in an international market, you could, in, at least in principle, constitute a new accountability structure that avoids the harms that are associated with market power. So this is an extremely, extremely simple economic idea, but very radical. It would require fundamentally rethinking the way that uh, corporations uh, are accountable, operate, and uh, re reimagine corporate governance um, uh, as a remedy for uh, market power. But there's huge problems in making this happen, and there really have been uh, since Dewey's time and ones he talked about at length. You have to identify who are these stakeholders? How do you quantify and define them? And even if you can sort of in some technocratic or objective way define them, how do they organize themselves given that they're distributed all around the world? You know, creating a polity in a country, think about like what the European Union has been trying to do, even within well-defined states that have had relationships with each other for years, trying to make themselves think of themselves as a polity, organize political parties, find people who represent them. This is an incredibly uh, difficult thing uh, to achieve in a distributed set of people <clears throat> subject to the power of a technological uh, you know, platform. Then these people need to find a way to communicate with each other, to reach political decisions, to come up with common understandings, to set an agenda, and eventually to make collective decisions. Uh, especially in an environment where, you know, for commercial product or for uh, uh, workers, different people will be subject to the power of these companies to different extent. How do you even quantify that? How do you, how do you get a sense of who thinks what? All these things are super challenging. And, you know, we've seen these problems play out in practice. Companies like OpenAI and Anthropic, there's recently been quite a lot of news, about the way in which they've tried to set up a governance structure so that they're accountable to more than shareholders, so they're accountable to some notion of the common good. And, uh, you know, I don't think all of these experiments have been entirely successful, um, partly because of some of these problems that we've been talking about, how, do you, how one actually makes something in a meaningful and responsible way accountable uh, to something other than uh, shareholders. But, I actually think this is one area where technology has a lot to do to help. And, and this is what uh, plurality is, is all about. Um, technology uh, offers ways um, increasingly for people to connect uh, across very potentially diverse uh, physical situations and backgrounds. Potentially, this can be gated and quantified uh, using some of the technologies that you guys have been talking about. For the last couple of days, there are platforms like Polis um, that allow people to deliberate and reach uh, respectful um, common understandings across differences, find consensual points to move forward on um, in a way that traditional social media has not succeeded in doing. Uh, LLMs offer the possibility for people to do this much more quickly, much more responsibly, and much more detail with much less individual attention uh, that might have been unrealistic for them to supply in other times. There are new voting techniques that allow in a much more natural and continuous way for people with varying degrees of stake or interest um, in a topic to express these differing degrees of stake or interest um, while still having, you know, a baseline of kind of democratic equality. And, and these tools are not just uh, theoretical, they're increasingly being used. Uh, they've helped transform Taiwan into the world's most successful digital democracy under the leadership of Audrey Tong, the world's first digital uh, transgender minister, um, who came out of an Occupy movement that occupied their national legislature for three weeks, but used these tools to build consensus so that she became the first Occupy leader to become a minister in, in a government. Um, and there is a large civic technology movement that's addressed problems from the pandemic to uh, mis misinformation, major policy questions. And these tools are increasingly making their way 
back into the governance of these AI platforms through OpenAI's Democratic Inputs to AI project and Anthropic's collective writing of their constitutional AI recently. Um, and I think that this potentially offers a really exciting alternative approach to coping with market power rather than um, on, you know, breakups or, uh, you know, allowing market power to run rampant. Instead, one can think about changing the ownership structure, harnessing some of these tools and uh, holding companies accountable for being up with the uh, state of the art in terms of what's possible um, as a uh, way of, as an intervention for uh, mergers, for monopolization, uh, et cetera. Now, there are some major limits to what antitrust is not so good at dealing with. It is focused on consumers and workers, commercial counterparties, not externalities, disinformation, uh, bio risk, et cetera, um, pollution. Those have to be dealt with through other mechanisms, possibly also ways of bringing stakeholders into the process. But antitrust doesn't have the tools to directly address that, but it does what it does have that's quite powerful is ways to directly quantify the stake that different consumer groups have. And especially with the types of computational tools that you all are talking about, this becomes highly heterogeneous, highly rich, gives us a real sense of the types of individuals who are subject to what degree of power and therefore should be included in uh, representation schemes that are empowered by these more flexible uh, digital participation tools. Um, and uh, therefore, I think it's really exciting to imagine how antitrust, rather than just treating all companies, whether nonprofit or however organized the same, can instead try to uh, steer the development in a way that's consistent with the things that are already evolving, but combats the natural tendency of the markets to instead collapse everything to just a simplistic, um, you know, uh, corporate uh, structure. And um, instead uh, can both in terms of where interventions occur and what the shape of those interventions are consider the nature of the accountability of the organization uh, and try to steer that accountability in directions that are already being explored by the industry uh, in ways that um, create an incentive for and uh, pressure towards inclusive, digitally empowered stakeholder uh, governance. Um, and this is part of uh, a broader plurality movement that uh, I'm involved in uh, that was really inspired by tai, uh, Audrey Tong, Taiwan's digital minister in uh, Mandarin, in the traditional Mandarin that they use in Taiwan, the characters shown on this uh, picture for um, plural and digital are the same. And so uh, there's this tradition of developing technology to empower uh, pluralism and participatory governance. Um, and uh, we represent that by these overlapping uh, squares, which are a Unicode character. And uh, we develop everything as part of an open source participative process. Welcome all of you to join in that, become co-creators, co-authors, recognized collaborators on the project. And if that interests you, uh, check out this QR code which has um, a bunch of ways to connect to us. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn over to Zoe to uh, answer questions and stop my sharing. Actually, I'll, I guess I'll leave it up there just in case I don't want to see it. All right, thank you so much. Um, so questions will come in the chat. I see one already. Um, maybe let me abuse my position of power here and start with two questions that I had. Um, the first question is what maybe more of a technical question and then more of an institutional question. The first one on the technical side is whether or not you see blockchain playing a role, especially in the governance of those, whether AI companies or AI system. Sure. 
Thanks so much for the question. Um, certainly Web3 and blockchain systems can be a valuable way of attributing stakes to a collective project. And so insofar as those tools have developed in the blockchain and Web3 space, I think those tools are absolutely applicable. I mean, whether those are, you know, whether those really harness the true value of blockchain as a trustless network is another question. Um, but certainly yeah. one of the most exciting innovations that came out of the explosion of interest in blockchain was the idea of the DAO, the idea of a cooperative social endeavor where different people have different kinds of voting rights in line with their um, in line with their interests. And so insofar as those tools have been developed in, the, in that space, absolutely, they can be ap applied and brought into uh, into the sorts of questions that we're talking about today. And so this actually brings my second question, which is uh, the expertise that you would need within competition agencies, right? So I understand this is not just for competition agencies, but if they have a role to play, which kind of expertise do you think they would need to acquire in order to do it well, right? To understand what they do when they indeed enforce those remedies. Yeah, the question of enforcement here, I think, is a huge one and um, one that we're starting to think about. I think that one of the key forms of expertise, I mean, there's there's one level on which you might think that there's a high level of expertise required to make any of these systems enforceable or enforced. On the other hand, um, there's there are ways that we can think about in which the company itself is not the one that is running the democratic processes and there might be a, a sort of third party or some kind of um, some kind of self-governed DAO or decentralized group that is in charge of the democratic processes so that there's not necessarily a burden on the antitrust authorities or the competition authorities to understand what the firm is doing, but rather they can trust the group that is collectively determining their own questions because it's in that group's interest to collectively determine itself. So there's there are interesting questions about you know, the burden of enforcement and also which or which groups of people who have stake who have stake in this firm have different kinds of incentives to truthfully represent how they're uh, collectively governing. One, one thing I would just add is one type of uh, expertise that I think would be really important would be corporate governance expertise, which is not a traditional focus in antitrust authorities, um, as well as expertise in some of these digital tools that empower more creative forms of corporate governance. So. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'll just, I'll put the link to your QR code in the chat right now for everyone to just access and I will stop sharing your screen so we can see you actually. Um, yes, like this. All right, perfect. So yes, all right, you're back. So not to make your life any easier, we covered the technical aspect, institutional aspect, and now some maybe more substantial aspects of antitrust. One question we have in the chat is whether or not you see concrete adjustments needed in order for for what you propose to fit within the antitrust framework, right? Um, so again, not making your life any easier here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly what the what the differences would have to be, but I think there's some there's some degree to which the theoretical underpinnings, as Glenn pointed out throughout the talk, the theoretical underpinnings of the whole idea of antitrust really do naturally point to the kinds of solutions that we've been talking about. Um, and those theoretical underpinnings, as Glenn touched on, are really fundamentally about you know, the fact that the key problem with a monopoly is that it doesn't internalize externalities of its stakeholders. And so in a, on a really basic level, if we look at you know, the whole point of antitrust and what it's direct, what it's trying to do, what it was set up to do back in the day, 
it really does directly point to this idea that people, you know, if there's an effective form of collective governance, then that is a natural remedy to the kinds of market power that monopolies and so forth um, can come about. Now, what that means for the uh, for the actual practice and precedent and so forth, I'll, I think we'll defer to the lawyers. Yeah, I would just, I, I would, to follow up on the, like what the practical aspects might potentially be. One is there's a long tradition of treating nonprofits differently in antitrust. This happens in hospital issues. This happens with the major league baseball, many different things. And there's a social interest and trying to rigorously define uh, notions of accountability to stakeholders and then make those criteria for uh, different treatment, I think would be very valuable. And the second aspect would be um, to consider as a uh, you know non-structural remedy or a quasi-structural remedy, the changing of stake or the empowerment of counterparties that could have uh, power over the firm like labor unions. And so when you're talking about remedies, do you have in mind this kind of remedies in the antitrust sense of the term, meaning yeah. I see a yeah. practice and I intervene only when I see a practice, or would you also envision that this could work ex ante, right? So you would intervene just based on a monopoly position without any practice in specifics. Sorry, I don't think I, I understood the, the last piece of your question. So, so I, I guess my I point is, would you, yeah, whether or not this will only apply ex post, meaning I spot a practice which is anti-competitive in the sense of antitrust, and then I impose what you propose as a remedy, or would it also work without any infringement of antitrust, but just, you know, intervening on the market based on other criteria? It's a great question. I think that, well, first, first I'd say that um, I would hope that in a world where this is initially used as an antitrust remedy, then firms that seem to be amassing large market power in order to avoid an antitrust suit would start to adopt these kinds of procedures and may even see the benefits of the, these forms of collective governance without any sort of um, remedy or, or need coming from an external agency. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and I, and I all, but I also think that, look, we're talking this in the antitrust audience. They have certain tools available to them. The things that Zoe yeah. are talking about, uh, you know, like that's those are great. But what people on this call can actually probably do is impose remedies uh, at the stage of conduct. So uh, I think, you know, part of the message is for regulators, part of this message is for antitrust enforcers, part of this message is for people at companies trying to avoid problem with regulators. And, and I think it has, it's a potential solution in all those three contexts, so. Yeah. So one more question in the chats, uh, which I think is, I mean, I like because this is thinking outside of the box, but we always come back to this idea of a box and here more specifically of a black box. And I guess I will turn the question a bit differently. The question is whether or not you see concerns regarding the black box of AI and the lack of transparency, or at least, and you know, the ability to understand. But my question would be, if policymakers are to use AI in their remedies, the fact that indeed they cannot always especially some policymakers with just, you know, we have antitrust agencies with just 10 employees. So those agencies won't be in a position to fully understand the functioning of AI. And if there is a black box issue, is it a limit to what you are proposing or is it not? Yeah, I mean, I think that the black box issues with AI are, are real uh, challenges, but are not necessarily impediments to democratic oversight or participation. Um, because to a large extent, the black box issues apply to anyone interacting with the system, uh, not just to external people. Now, of course, non-disclosures of source data, that, that, that there's a lot of trickier issues there. But um, there are plenty of things that are black boxes that are democratically governed. We didn't reveal nuclear secrets, and yet we had uh, you know, a democratic government determining how those nuclear weapons were going to be used. So, uh, and, and we saw with the constitutional AI for Anthropic, 
You can have democratic participation in writing a constitution that are instructions given to a black box algorithm. So I, I definitely think the black box issue is an important issue and a challenge in a lot of different ways, but I'm not sure it is particularly an impediment to the capacity to have democratic accountability, at least somewhere in the chain. I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of the, um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric today that emphasizes the black box nature of AI. And some of that rhetoric comes from the very people who want, um, who have an interest in maintaining a kind of um, mysticism or mystery about how these systems work. And their incentive to maintain that mystery is, an, is coming from their desire to not be understood and not be regulated in the ways that we're talking about today and you've been talking about throughout the conference. Yeah, I see that sometimes going to some conferences where, you know, the main message is it's all complicated, which is true, but it doesn't mean that we cannot comprehend the subject. Okay, one final question. You've mentioned Taiwan, and I know, Glenn, you're going to be there uh, very soon. What can you learn from their experience in actually successfully, you know, doing something similar or that is actually inspiring to you? Uh, in into you know maybe trying to transpose that into antitrust or to put it differently you know what have they done so that it it lived the box of being just an idea to something they've done in practice what was the secret for them I mean I, I think there's many things at play there one one is a, a, a sense of threat uh, from geopolitical scenarios and the mobilization of civil society that came with that. Um, another was, you know, an exceptional group of very civic minded people who are grounded in a tradition there where civil society has played a huge role, even back to the dictatorship. Um, so, you know, mobilizing that civic society, connecting it to the technology uh, was critical. And those things are often very separated in in the US. There's like a tech sector that doesn't get very involved in civil society. There's a activist civil society sector that maybe harnesses Twitter, but doesn't really think about the design of technology. So connecting those things up are very powerful. And my hope is that if we tell the story in the right way, if we dramatize it for people, if we make people feel palpably that sense of threat and possibility of connection, that some of that fabric will be created and empower something similar to happen in, you know, say the US and Europe. Yeah. All right. Well, on that, I think creating a sense of threats is uh, a good way where to, to end this conversation. So to both of you, thank you so very much. Um, uh, again, I knew this would be not just food for thought, but uh, an old buffet of that. And this is definitely what we got. So thank you so much for, for, for the keynote and answering the questions. Um, I hope to see you soon in person. And we move on to the next panel.